Um, week three of Jesus stories, and we're looking at stories of Jesus right out of the Gospels, and um, the first four books of the New Testament written by uh, four different individuals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they give their account of the life of Jesus, and we're actually taking, it's kind of fun, we're taking some clips from the television series, Chosen, the Chosen TV series, and we're showing them, and we're kind of preaching through that story, and I'm going to I'm gonna do that here in just a moment. But first, let, let, me, let me talk about something that I, I want to introduce to, to help introduce this concept today. Um, I'm going to talk about failure some today, and I got to be honest with you up front, is I don't like to fail. I don't like to to fail. I don't like to lose. I don't like to play games in which I lose. Uh, anybody in the building agree with me? You just don't like to lose, right? You got a, got some winners in the room. Uh, definitely had to learn to lose because that is part of growing up. And I have, I'm kind of grown up at this point. So I've kind of embraced losing to a degree, but I don't like it. I don't like to fail. I, I'm not going to play a game with you that I don't feel like I could probably win this game. If I don't think deep down I could win, I'm not playing. It's not playing. I, I don't like to lose when I play golf. I don't like to have a bad round of golf, even if people aren't really keeping score. Of course, you keep score, but even if it's not competitive, it's always competitive with me. I am keeping score. I remember when our kids, our boys were little. They were like, you know, five years old playing t-ball, and they're not, we don't keep score. I'm keeping score, so... You may not keep score, but I'm keeping score. I know what the score is. I know who won the game. Um, if I play golf and I don't have a good round and I come home, I really don't want to talk about it. Like My, my family knows. If you ask me how, to, how does the golf round go, if I just say, that's good, then that's all you need to say. Don't, don't, don't press. You know, don't push. But if they, if they don't, if I have a good round now, I do want to talk about it, Right? So, like, I'm looking for opportunities. So Felicia says, would you like a roll with dinner? I am said, funny you said roll, roll, roll. I was, the greens were rolling so well today. And, man, I was rolling putts in right and left. My putter was on fire. Like, I'm looking for oppor opportunities to talk about my wins. But I don't like to fail. But here's what I want to encourage everybody with today. All of you failures out there. Because we, we all fail. We all fail. The good news is that God has a track record of using failures. In fact, one of the things I love about the Bible is that um, God doesn't gloss over the uh, issues and the imperfections of people, of men and women, like heroes of the faith, amazing men and women of God. God does not paint them out to be perfect People. In fact, he reveals like gross imperfections, showing us that no matter how messed up we are and no matter how perfect our God is, he is still willing to interact with and collaborate with imperfect people like you and I. And he can not only bring you through mistakes and failures in your past, but he can take you into an amazing future in spite of your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups. So the question of the day is not, will we fail? The question is, how do we respond to that failure? And, and I'm going to show a clip here in just a moment, but before I do, I want to read, read through the story from the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. And it says this, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats. Everybody say, he got into one of the boats. The one belonging to Simon. And he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water, say deep water, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we have not caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Matters 
who your partners are. When you're in failure, it matters who your partners are. When you're in blessing, it matters who your partners are. And they came and they filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I want you to see the posture of the failure who was Peter. Go away from me. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. But Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to fish for people. They pulled their boats up on shore and they left everything. And they followed him. Let me look at the clip. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. My brother and the baptizer, <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do.
as well. Yes, you, James and John, come, follow me. I'll take the fish to the market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> You've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, now. So in this, in this text, Jesus is in the process of calling his first disciples. Up to this point, he had not called any of the 12 men that he was going to use to start a movement to change the world, to save the world. And by the way, that movement, that movement worked. Anything Jesus does worked. But those, those 12 men that, that, that he called started this movement. It began in the upper room on the day of Pentecost with 120 people. And uh, now in 2024, two plus billion people around the planet. Those men's lives are still making an impact on us today. But I want to point out that Jesus approached these men following failure. He approached them on the backside of a whole night of fishing where they had caught nothing following fail, failure. They were, they were fishermen. They were trained in the trade of fishing. And they had, they had fished all night long. And this was a big deal, okay? Because this was not like you taking your boy out to the local neighborhood pond on a Sunday afternoon. This was how they survived. This was how they fed their family. This is how they paid their debts, and so it was a big deal when they go and they don't catch anything at all. And P Peter was headed home, probably hoping that his wife wouldn't ask. So, how was your night of fishing? Um, he, he had been a it had been a failure. So it's intriguing to me because you you would assume that Jesus, when he's calling the people that are gonna he's going to save the world with, you would, you would assume that he would want to be associated with winners. Like he would be looking for the ones who had caught the most fish. Who caught the most fish? All right, I'm choosing you guys. But that's, that's never how Jesus worked. And this story tells us that Jesus loves the losers. He is a friend of the failures. And in fact, the first three disciples that he called, he called them following failure. Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that God always presents us with an opportunity to move forward following failure. Like your enemy wants you to think that your failure is final, but it's just the opposite. God generally allows us an opportunity to move forward following failure. I want to pull a few things from this, this passage that that Simon, Simon Peter did today to help us know how to fail forward. First thing that, that happens in the story, in the text, is that, that Jesus got into Simon's boat. And I know this seems very juvenile and, and elementary, if you will, but if you're going to fail forward, you're going to have to invite Jesus into your everyday life. Like, like every, your everyday life, you have to understand this boat um, was, Simon was not, you know, at the temple. Simon was on his job. Is Jesus in that boat in your world? Simon, this was his identity. Like this was likely a business he had inherited. Certainly James and John who were fishing with their father, Zebedee, they had in inherited this job. This is, so this is inheritance. This is identity. This is their life. And, and Simon invited Jesus into his, his boat. And, and I know like on, like on Sunday, everybody wants Jesus in their boat. When you're, when you're at church, everybody's like, Jesus, you're in my boat. You're in my boat. But, but he doesn't just want to be in your boat on Sunday. He doesn't just want to be your savior on Sunday. He wants to be your Lord on Monday. He, he wants to be in your Mondays 
whenever you're going into that meeting or you get that call. He wants to be in your Tuesdays when you're balancing the checkbook and you realize your husband bought something that was not approved. He wants to be in your Wednesdays when your kids are acting all demon-possessed. He wants to be in your Thursdays when you have to make that Walmart run with those crazy Walmart people. He wants to be in your boat on Friday night when you got that hot date. Oh, we love Sunday, Jesus. You can be in my church boat, but not my dating boat, Jesus. You're not ready for that boat. He wants to be in that boat. When you're hanging out with the boys on Saturday night, he, he has to be in that boat as well. Does he have carte blanche access to every area of your life? You're never going to step into the fulfillment of all of God's plans for your life if you're limiting him as Lord. If you're using him as a Sunday savior only. He's got to be in every area of our life. Our habits, our hobbies, our friendships, our relationships, our career, our, our finances. Oh, we, we love heart Jesus. We don't much care for money, Jesus, right? He's got to be in every area of our life. Is he in your social media boat? Is he he in your Spotify playlist boat? Come on, is he in your Netflix watching boat? He's got to be in every single area of your life. He needs to be invited into your boat, even following failure. One of the things that I've noticed about human nature is that after failure is whenever we turn our back on the one that we should be running towards. Like I need him more after failure than any other time. But because of the way the enemy works with guilt and condemnation, following failure is when we don't show up to church. Right, it's when we when we skip small group. It's whenever we decide I can't serve today, or even if you're in the building, you, you don't feel like you can lift your hands following failure. Satan wants your personal failure to turn into faith failure. He he wants you to give up because you have messed up. But this is not how God works. This is when we need him the most. And he wants somebody in the room to understand that your failure is not final. He is not finished with you yet. He got into their boat after failure. Have you invited Jesus into your boat following failure? Can I have some water? Babe? I, I talk, took it down there. Just t- toss it. You, you got a good arm. Come on. go. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Is he, is, he, is he in your boat? Have you allow, allowed him in your boat following failure? Following, following failure? He, he got in their boat. And some people, some people honestly have been living in a, a cycle of failure. A cycle of failure. And, and Jesus can actually show up and break a cycle of failure. He did throughout the Gospels. He showed up to a man at the pool of Bethesda who had been sick for 38 years. And once a year... Legend had it that the water at the pool would be troubled, and if you could get into the water first, you would be healed. But every year, he would try to get into the water first, but someone would beat him to it. He would fail at receiving his healing. But Jesus showed up and broke a cycle of failure for this man and made him completely whole. The woman with the, with the issue of blood, 12 years of failure, right? Right? She had tried, when the doctor spent all of her money, tried everything that she could to stop the bleeding, but could not stop it. Twelve years of failure until she met Jesus, and he broke the cycle of failure. Israel wandering for 40 years, like going in circles. They had been brought out of Egypt, and they had a place of promise that God wanted to take them into. Let me just remind you, God never brings you out of something without having plans to take you into something else. If you've been delivered from something, hear me today. God has another space for you to occupy, a place for you to occupy, an assignment for your life. But Israel didn't tap into that place, that space, because of fear and lack of faith, lack of trust. 
So God had to show up and break this cycle of doubt and fear in order to get them into their place of promise. And there are some here today who've been living in the season of failure, and God wants you to know today he's shown up, and he wants to break that cycle. Whether it's anxiety, whether it's addiction, whether it's loneliness, whether it's fear, God wants to break that cycle of failure today. You just got to let him in your boat. You got to let him into every area of your life. And then when you let him in, you got to follow the directions that he gives you. Follow the directions. Even if they make no sense. So often when God gives us directions, they don't make sense until he shows up. And then you're like, oh, okay. I see what you are doing. But in the moment, it made no sense at all. But if you'll follow his directions, he'll take you through. So look, watch, what, watch what this story says in verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water. Put out into deep water. This did not make sense. Listen, I, I think that God is, is, is wanting some individuals to kind of get off the shore in your relationship with him. Move away from the safe space in your relationship with him and get out into some deep water. I think that today God is calling some people to like go all in in your relationship with him. Instead of keeping your relationship with Jesus kind of at, at an arm's distance, instead of kind of living in the periphery on the shore, get off the shore and go all in. Like get connected. The enemy wants to keep you on the shore because the enemy knows if he'll keep you on the shore in a safe place, then you'll never tap into all that God has, the life, the abundant life that he has for you. But God is calling you out in the deep. Go all in. Join a small group. Lead a small group. Join a rock star team. Get involved. Start giving. Go all in. Get out into the deep water. He said, push out into deep and then let down your nets for a catch and watch what Simon said. Master, I want you to try to hear. I know we just saw an, an adaption uh, 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 on the screen, but let's, I, want you to, I want you to kind of imagine Peter's voice. He's been, he's been fishing all night. He's tired. He, he's exhausted. He is, uh, he's frustrated. He's not only tired, but he's angry. You ever, you ever been tired and angry? It's not a great, great place to be in. This is not the time I want my kids to come to me about much of anything. This is not when I want a text, you know, a, a difficult text. Um, he, he, was, he was tired. He's frustrated, Master. He said, we have worked all night and I, every time I see this phrase all night, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I just can't help but hear Lionel Richie. I just want to sing it. Is it okay if I sing it? <laughs> all night long, all night, all night, all night long. Anyway, every time I see it, I think that. I've, I've avoided it in the other services, but it gets a little crazy at 1130. I'm just telling you. There's no service following, and so it's all, this is, this is it. Nobody's, it's just y'all. It's just us chickens right here in, in the room. But I, so, so every time I see that, Master, we've worked hard all night long, and we have not caught anything at all. Here's what Simon was really saying. He, he was saying, Master, you, <laughs> you know, you're a carpenter. You're, car, you're a good carpenter. You, your, your daddy trained you to be a carpenter. Jesus, you're... You're a good carpenter. We're fishermen. We know how to fish. You stick to the carpentering and let us stick to the fishing. Like we know what we're doing and we have been working hard at it all night long. How many times have we handled Jesus this way? Right? Jesus, I know what I am doing. And he's like, well, it, it ain't, don't seem to be working. I, I know what I'm doing. You stick to the Jesusing, and I'll stick to my dating. But how's that working out for you? Well, not so well. I, I keep. I go from one loser to the next. Maybe you're looking in all the wrong places. And Jesus is like, I, I, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all of this stuff will be added unto you. Just, just, just saying. You stick to the Jesusing. This is my money. I know how to handle. My money. 
Ten percent? What? You stick to the Jesus thing. I'll stick to the investing of my finances. How many times have we handled Jesus this way? Jesus, I don't have time to join a small group. Just look. And he's like, well, of course you have time. You have time for whatever you want to have time for. It's just a matter of priorities. Jesus, you, this, is, this is my time. This is, this is my life. And this is what Simon was doing. Master, we've, we've worked hard all night. And we, have, we, haven't, we haven't caught anything. And he could have continued to push back. He really could have. The story could have turned out completely different. But failure has a way of humbling you over, over time, right? Like when that thing that you knew would work did not work, it's amazing how you're like, oh, okay. Sometimes it takes me getting to the end of me before I have the sense to wake up and see who I really, really need, who I really need. And and, and through one simple act of obedience, Simon showed Jesus that he could be trusted. One simple act. You know, Jesus has, to, has a way of not blessing those who can't be trusted. He's not careless, I should say, with his blessing. He's not careless. If we don't have what it takes to receive blessing, to receive a miracle. We have to show him that we're willing to obey, that we're willing to move before the miracle. Like, like it's amazing how miracles and blessings and calling tends to come on the other side of obedience. Like all through the gospels, as they went, they were healed. Go show yourself to the priest, but why would we do that? And as they went, as they moved, the miracle happened. Like, miracle tends to come from, from movement, from, from movement. And we have, to, we have to show him that we have what it takes. And listen, what God has for you, I said it last week, what God has for you is going to require movement from you. It's going to require Movement from you, where you are going to ultimately be, is going to be determined by the deep water you're willing to row out into, by the nets that you are willing to let down. And Simon answered and let the nets down. I want to read Luke chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. The end of the story, this talks about James and John, they were also called, but Jesus said to Simon at the end of verse 10, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. You will fish for people. Verse 11 says, so they pulled their boats up on shore and they left him. They left everything, I'm sorry, and they followed him. Peter's decision to obey Jesus was a tipping point that led him to the real reason that Jesus was there in the first place. To call Simon to follow him. So number three, we want to let Jesus in the boat. We want to do what he says to do. And we want to surrender to the higher call that he has for us. Like this is the, this is the step that someone needs to take today. Just surrender to the higher call. Even in the midst of failure, God wanted Simon to know that that failure did not change his calling. It did not cancel his calling. Like, like l- later on, in a, different, in a different story, after Peter was already following Jesus, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, the night that he was crucified, Simon um, was with Jesus and fired up and telling him, I'm going to go with you all the way. He was a passionate Jesus follower. I mean, the soldier came. He cut the dude's ear off. Jesus had to put the ear back on. And like Simon calmed down. Like he was fired up about following Jesus. But Jesus knew that he was not only coming from failure, but that he was going to even fail in the future. Like my, my failure in the past, didn't stop Jesus from saving me. And my future failures doesn't stop Jesus from saving me. In fact, what, what he said to Simon in Luke 22 and verse 32 is, I've prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail so that when you have repented 
Like Simon was like, what am I going to be repenting for? Well, you'll find out when you get there. When you have repented and turned to me again, like God already made a, a pathway for Peter to come back to Jesus even before he sinned, even before he denied that he knew Jesus three times. When you have repented, turn to me again. So in other words, we'll be in relationship again, but we won't just be in relationship then you need to go strengthen your brothers. I still have purpose for you. So after after failure, once you repent and turn to me again, I've still got a call on your life. Like you you, you need to strengthen your brothers. Uh, We we, want to let Jesus in our boat, want to do what he tells us to do. And then we want to surrender to the higher call that he has for us. See, for Simon Peter, I want you to catch this. This, this miracle that we saw uh, on the screen today was, was, was a lot bigger than just a, a fishing assignment. Like, yeah, there was crazy blessing come, all the fish, and they were able to you know, pay some debts off and all that stuff, but this was a lot bigger. Than, there was a lot more on the line that Simon had no idea about. Simon did not know that he would go from experiencing the miracle of the fish to actually participating in another miracle that had to do with fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish. And he, as Jesus was, was, was breaking it and handing it out, the, the disciples were, were distributing it to, to 5,000 men plus women and children one day. And he was involved in another miracle. So he went from experiencing the miracle of the fish to participating. Simon didn't know all of that. Simon did not know that one day when the disciples were in a storm and Jesus came walking across on the water and they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. It's, it's, it's me. Simon didn't know that when he, he would say, Lord, if it's you, let me come out there, that he would actually have the opportunity to walk on water. What an unbelievable miracle. Simon did not know that in Acts chapter 2, the day that the church began that we are still part of today, that he would be the one called on to stand up with the 11 and preach the first message of the church and see 3,000 people saved that day. He didn't know that all of that was in his future. He just knew he had failed. He had allowed Jesus in his boat. Jesus had told him something to do, and he said, okay, Even begrudgingly, he did it. He did it. And whoa, look at this miracle. But but man, that wasn't what this story was about. All those fish, that's that's a cool story. You're able to pay off some debt. But that's not what this is about. This is about a much higher calling, an eternal plan for your life. So what is it that God has been talking to you about doing it? God's been challenging you to do, and you've been kind of pushing back because that doesn't even really make sense. Let, why would you let down my neck? Why would, why would you want me to teach in Kids Rock, Jesus? Why would you want me to lead a small group? I, 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 why, why would you want me to do that? Well, because he knows if you're, if you're willing to let down the net and, and teach in Kids Rock, it's, it's not about even that first weekend, but uh, over time you're going to start putting truth of God's word and values from God's word into little hearts and little minds and you never know who you're going to be ministering to that's going to grow up and they're going to touch lives and they're going to touch lives and it's going to multiply and tens of thousands and even millions of lives could be changed for all of eternity based on one decision from you to let down your net and say, okay, I guess I'll go teaching kids rock. Even though I don't know a lot about the Bible. Do you think Simon was qualified to do what Jesus called him to do? He doesn't call the qualified. <laughs> That's not how he works. He's a friend of failures. He loves losers. We just have to be willing to say, nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. I joined that small group and it might not be week two or week three or week four, but maybe week seven, I, I share something from my own life. And there's someone sitting across the table whom I I might not even know very well. But like God speaks directly to them through me. And their life is forever altered. We all have moments like that. That we could point to where somebody said something. They don't even remember saying it. I preached at a place Wednesday night in Dallas. And the pastor there is a young man. But years ago. 
Mason was 14 years old, my oldest son. And he was at a camp in, in South Texas, a church camp. And this young man who was not the senior pastor then, he was just a youth pastor at that church, but he was helping work in the camp. And he called Mason up and he spoke some words over him. He had no idea who Mason was, no idea who he was. But he spoke about God's hand on his life and there's a tenderness about you and God is, God is going to use you to help. And it was just this amazing kind of prophetic word over, over my son. And whenever I was going to preach there last week, it hit me that that had happened. And I went and I found a video because someone had shot a video of it and sent it to me. And Alicia and I just sat there and wept. Because now we're seeing fruits of a word, of obedience. See, and, and who knows how many lives will be changed, by, by, not just by my son, but by all of the young men and women that this particular pastor invested in over the years. See, you, you, don't, you don't know. To you, it's just about the nets. I need, I need some fish. And God's like, okay, well, I'll give you some fish. But I'm doing that just to build your faith, to get you to do what I really want you to do. Follow me. Follow me. And now you're going to receive fish, but you're going to be passing out fish, and you're going to be blessing hundreds of thousands. And with Simon Peter, I mean, he preached a sermon that there are two billion Christians around the world right now, and it started with him. But it started at just obedience. Drop the net down. It's a higher calling. It's a higher calling. What is it with you? What is it for you? I'll let the Holy Spirit just kind of talk to you. Can we close our eyes? We'll close our eyes for a moment. Let me pray for you. Mm. What is it? What is it? Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Show us, God. Let him in your boat. Let him in your boat. Do what he's asking you to do. And accept and embrace the higher call that he has for your life. That it's so much bigger than you. Bigger than any of us. I want to start here today and I want to pray for those in the room who are not in a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to him. That's your starting point. If you've never given your life to Jesus, this moment is for you. Maybe today you need to rededicate your life to Jesus. This moment is for you. He loves you just like you are. He's a friend of sinners. He's a friend of failures. He gets in the boat with failures. So just like you are, he loves you and accepts you. But he loves you too much, Simon, to leave you the way that you are. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to see who I'm praying for. Nobody looking around, if you don't mind. If you, if you say, Jonathan, that's me, man. I, I, I need to fully surrender my life to Jesus, whether it's for the first time or you are rededicating your life to him. Will you throw a hand in the air right now? Come on, hold it high in the air. Leave them up, please, if you don't mind making a fresh start. Leave them up. That's awesome, guys. Hands all over the room. I want to see them all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Yes. 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 <laughs> all right. You can put your hands down now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer of surrender. I invite everybody to pray this prayer along with me. You can use your words or mine. Lord Jesus, I surrender everything to you. On this March weekend of 2024, I'm starting over. I'm making you the Lord of my life. And I'm following you. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you gave your life for me. And that you rose from the grave. And today I, I repent. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, my mistakes, my failures, my shortcomings. Thank you that you're a friend of failures. Thank you for getting in my boat today, Lord Jesus. I'm making you the Lord and the Savior of my life. I'm going to follow you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Come on, and everybody said amen. Come on, a big hand for all those who just took that step of faith, y'all. That's awesome.